pretty much at the time when uh, the Indian subcontinent was uh, divided, also divided into different parts. And the red part was the Soviet part. You can hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Yeah. It, and so the um, industrial development for the world market happened in West Germany. That is the part that is on the left. Oh, now we, yeah, on the left side, the green and uh, the yellow and the blue that was then occupied by the Allied powers and became a separate nation until 1990. Yeah. So we can move on to my outline. Next slide. And so I will tell you a little bit about surpluses, the reason for the export surpluses, the role of the common currency in Europe, then I move to the supply chain. And the supply chain issue in Germany is not so much concerned how to access the supply chain, it's really more the outsourcing, meaning the head of the supply chain and then moving industry out to other countries. At the end, I will talk a little bit about the risks for the future. Next slide, please. Here you see the black or red, the black line is the export, the red, the imports, down you see the bars that tell you about the surplus of so this whole period of the past 20 years. See, more than imports and quite a bit, and that had also different countries for the world. The next Here you see the global imbalances of the countries that have a surplus are above the zero line. You see the key country with the surplus is actually Germany. It is not uh, China nowadays, and it is much smaller than China. Germany has about 8 million inhabitants, while China has 1.4 billion. Yeah. Move on to the next slide, where you can see where the exports are going to. The one with the red is telling the destinations of German exports. And the, most of it goes back to the neighboring countries in Europe, and then to China and the United States. If they are going to China, you see the big difference in relationship to some of our neighbors, because the German industry is supplying the machinery for the consumption and production in China, while our European neighbors uh, in competition with the same product, the Chinese products. In the lower one, also that we also importing basically from the same countries, so it is very much of, of uh, intra-industry trade, but of, from Russia, because Russia is delivering the energy for Germany, and gas and oil. Move on to the next slide. Let's show to you that the component of German exports are machines, the transportation, basically cars, and chemical products. Yeah. And the imports are pretty much the same. Again, it's through the industry trade. 
you took the uh, blue product and uh, you move on to the next slide. And here I have made a list of the by Germany industry is quite successful. And the key is that actually Germany is successful in products that have been successful for a hundred years. The modern automobile was a German invention by Mercedes. And uh, the chemical industry, machine tool industry. So uh, the long past dependency of the industrial profile in Germany. And uh, Germany had specialized incremental innovations in the last 40 years, and not so much in radical. I'll get to this a little bit later on. And it has a lot of peculiarities of post collaboration. And I'll show you that in the next slides. So please, the next slide. Or oh, is the one uh, uh, the industrial device slide where we move in Big, the picture machine the down? Yes, this one. The, oh, oh, that was this one, yes. Now the ne next one would be the industrial profile. Uh, next slide. <coughs> yes, this, this slide. It shows you a typical German product, a complex machine. The advantage of exporting something like that is the price does not matter as much when we export a the garment pieces. And uh, so it is premium cuts, a specialized machine. We can move on to the next slide. This one should not show before, but it tells how complex, how many people are exported. Which is, of course, beneficial for an industry in the world market because then you are not dependent on, on product. If a few products are less in demand, then uh, you still have other products that can. And it's the uh, US and Japan, which have a bit more complex economy, but these are also bigger uh, nations. So the next slide, made in, uh, made in Germany. Here on top of it, it's not so easy to read. Uh, I'll just see it's small. But it tells you that uh, German product has seen and its quality products by many of the uh, foreign customers. So in Germany, in the blue bar is on, on the very left. And it tells you that uh, across 23 countries, in the average of uh, almost 50% deep that German product are very positive, very have a high quality. And that, of course, also then helps to sell products at a higher price. to explain the German production regime. Next slide. And please, yes. Oh, yeah, thanks. And the German production regime is a bit different from many other countries. Perhaps most similar might be our neighboring country, Austria, 
and a little bit of Denmark. But, uh, otherwise, Germany is quite peculiar. Uh, and, oh. Hello, are we back? Yes, okay. So, uh, when one compares economies, people have come to two different types of a lot capitalist economies. One is the liberal market economy that would stand for the UK and the US. And then they are coordinated market economy. The Germany belongs to the coordinator, meaning that the stakeholders are very much involved in what is called voice, meaning that they talk to each other. And it is not just say what is going on, but it's also other social groups in society uh, say in the future. And other elements of the production uh, it's long-term financing, full determination by labor, which I will explain soon, the specific form of training. Yeah. And research cooperation. We now can move on to the next so that I can explain it in more detail. The financing. Here, the banks play a larger role than in the annual Saxon world. Right? And they are sitting on the supervisory board of the companies. They were representing the other shareholders who, for example, customary voting rights. So when the shareholders kept their shares for the bank, and frequently the bank was voting for the shareholder. This has changed in the last decades a bit. And Germany has become a bit more Anglo Saxon in the world of finances, its industry, but uh, uh, the uh, Roots are still there, and especially the big with a large role. And I have a little picture with the red S, the logo of the community banks. They command a market share that is bigger than 30%. So we have a rather large public sector, which is unusual for a developed capitalist economy. It underlines the point of long-term commitment because the community banks know their customers quite well and are supporting them also in difficult times. Then move to the next slide. And here we have the labor relations. Oops, it was quick. Yes. Well, many industries and services, there is one collective agreement for the auto industry, for the steam industry, for retail, where the unions are bargaining with the employers' associations. So it is not that um, trade unionists for one company negotiating with the CEO of that company, you know, it is uh, negotiations among industry representatives and then trade unionists. Yeah. All is very special in Germany, and it is much the product of the specific circumstances of uh, the Second World War. This what is called determination. So every super company has a fixed council that has the same of what can be done within the factory concerning work tab, so they have to be consulted, and especially they have to be consulted with 
the company wants to set labor if they want to downsize. And most specific is that uh, things uh, presented on the supervisory boards of large corporations in Germany. And I have the logo of one of the trade unions, and that's our metal workers trade union, which is uh, the most powerful trade union within Germany. Yeah. So, at the time when the big uh, order of Volkswagen had a leadership problem, the diesel scandal, the uh, head of the trade union was for a short time until the supervisory board had a new vote, the uh, head of the supervisory board. So in a very crucial moment for the company, the trade union was actually then in leadership position. But that's what we call a union representation. Uh, workers are represented by the trade unions. They are also represented by work council, the people they vote into the office of the work council. If you have some questions, uh, of course, we uh, will to go into greater detail. Now we can move on to the next slide to a dimension of German labor relations. Oh, oh that's, oh, sorry. Okay. This one, this slide tells you also a little bit of what the impact is. I would imagine that if trade unions are so powerful in comparison to trade unions in other countries, that the wage would go up very high. The wages are quite high, but productivity is also very high. And the result of high productivity increases in wage moderation is that the unit labor costs of Germany were much lower than its European neighbor. You see that before the financial crisis of 2008, the union in Germany. Yeah. That also explains to some tension within the European community because of these great differences development of the unit labor costs. We can move now to, to education and training, which is also quite peculiar in Germany. Okay. The next slide. is the education and training. Uh, we, have, we are not sending everyone to high school, which is also 13 years instead of 12 years in the US. It is 13 years, but uh, students who are not wanting or are coming from a working class background and then leave school at a different level and then are not unemployed but are moving into what we call the dual training system. They will be, become apprentice and uh, will be trained in the company and at vocational schools. The next slides will explain that in more detail. So people who are not going into an academic profession, also train quite solidly and are moved into the, their profession of facts with positions early on. Then move now to the next slide. Here it shows you that uh, the apprentice will spend 70% of the time in a company, 30% of the time at a school. And that there are many occupations to choose from. 
uh, here I put down the number of 356, where you can uh, then learn very different types of occupations, and they are all strictly regulated and defined by national standards. And companies are really participating on the right side, probably it's a 400,000 company who are participating in the system. And down on the right side, you see the, the whole training program is being governed by the uh, government, but mostly by the employers and the trade unions and by the Chamber of Commerce. So it is, again, a sign of this coordinated market economy that the stakeholders are operating and are in constant touch with each other. The same is also true for the universities. We can move to the next slide. The Universities receive a lot of R&D funding, research and development funding from industry. And in the technical areas, we have two types of universities. We have uh, universities that uh, then train people at the higher level. And then we have universities that are called applied sciences. Of that, uh, where the students uh, learn a, a bit less in terms of theory and a bit more in terms of practice. And at the universities itself, most of the engineering researchers that are appointed to professorships have been in industry before and they keep their in touch with industry. And at the University of Applied Sciences, you cannot become a professor without having had some practical experience in industry. So you have also here a very close connection between industry and universities. And the last uh, paragraph tells you about a specific organization, which is called Fraunhofer Gesellschaft, which is a research organization that is spread throughout Germany and has a rather large budget, it is very close to industry. So it is, we have different types of research institutions. Some are fundamental, like the Planck institutions, but Fraunhofer uh, is uh, working very closely with industry, which is also shown in the next slide, a little example. Here, it is a product of a professor who worked with a small and medium-sized businesses to build the first practical transporter with the, over the postal system that runs completely on the energy. That's a typical example between universities and we can move to the next slide. I mentioned before the term incremental innovation, and here I define it a bit more in detail. It means that it tries to improve on what has and meaning the product and of course the production process and alerts by accumulating knowledge for that. And that allows to make products by complex by time. And it's quite well this profile of producing complex machine tools or being able to provide maintenance service for complex machinery right there. But it also means that one is stronger in established industries and less strong in more modern ones. Yeah. And these incremental innovations 
they require this kind of coordination, which I mentioned before. It means a long-term employment relationship, because if you hire and fire people that are not willing to really share their experience with the company, uh, you need to see them for the long haul. You can have to provide them stable working structures. You have to make sure that there's not so much poaching among industries. That's where these industry-wide wage agreements come in, so that uh, companies do not have the incentive that time to hire uh, good workers away from other companies. The wage agreements are holding for the whole industry. The house banks, which are then also the, uh, the companies in the time. Nevertheless, uh, it does not mean that Germany, with incremental innovation, is just driving behind. In some areas, it is also quite successful, but these areas fit into the path. In terms of the new autonomous driving technology, it is a German company that has holds or have filed the most patents. Uh, the company Bosch is uh, the biggest flyer company for automobiles in the world. The Nexus, Nexus three are all German companies. So within this line, you know, the traditional industry, then uh, they are quite ahead in innovations. But the problem is this feeling and moving out into a completely new industry. We are moving to the next slide. Now, uh, the Euro. In about 20 years ago, the European countries, the West European countries, decided to the their currency. So, France and um, Italy and uh, Austria, Spain, England, and so on, all have the same currency called Euro. Yeah. And the Euro got into a crisis about 10 years ago, which uh, then uh, led to a situation where um, the Euro weakened in relationship to the US dollar. And that, of course, helped the German export industry so this uh, euro was extremely helpful uh, in terms of the dollar, but it was even more helpful for the Germans in relationship to its neighbors, because in the past, when Germany had its own currency, German Mark, that was the name of the German currency, always appreciated against the currency of its neighbor, which made its product expensive. Now, German neighbors no longer protect the industry by depreciation of their currency because the currencies are now linked. So, Germany has a stronger position, the German industry now has a position than before because the neighbors cannot protect themselves through currency manipulations. We move to the next slide. The global crisis and overall the financial crisis had a beneficial impact on Germany because the interest rates really decreased substantially, and especially in relationship to its neighbors. You see, the very low line is the German line. And currently, if you want to buy German government bonds, then you don't get interest on it. You have to pay interest to the government. Just the reverse, so the negative interest rates, which is very peculiar. So uh, for the German government, it is really easy to uh, finance itself in the bond markets. 
But as the tax details are very positive currently, uh, the German government is not actually uh, looking for more loans to uh, pay for its working It's trying to reduce its uh, debt. So, so much here now. I provided you with uh, key elements of German export success. And now I'm going to move on to the second part of the title concerning the global value chains. I still have uh, about four or five slides and then um, can exchange ideas. So the next slide is on global value chain. And um, all the unit labor costs in Germany were lower in their development than among many, especially before the financial crisis. The difference in wages are nevertheless very high. So Germany has high wages, but also high productivity. And uh, this slide here shows you that the average wage in Germany was around, around 10 years ago, around 3,000 euros a month. And you see also the range. So in some companies it was higher, especially in the other companies, you will see it was higher. It was the wage for one working in a factory, uh, with vocational training, so having that type of training about, and having experience of working for an uh, auto supplier, not for a final assembly, but for an auto supplier company. Yeah. So the range was used to be between 2,400 and more than 4,000. Euros a month. To go to the right, you see the wage in the neighboring eastern countries, which was on average 850 for a person with the same income. So it's different. That was capable for German companies when the soft. Union disappeared and the East West divide, Eastern Europe became and also part of all of Europe. And, uh, and companies that you know, make use of this kind of invention, which I can show you the next part. Here you see. That the Soviet Union came down in 1990, and um, a few years later, then uh, it was clear that the Eastern, that the Eastern countries would join the European Union, and that then started the outsourcing process that German companies sitting next door to Eastern Europe were then outsourcing a lot of the simple production parts. The more labor intensive parts were outsourced. Here you see that within 10 years, outsourcing started from 9% to 37%. And afterwards, it stabilized at a high level and, and so on. So German industry really made use heavily from this wage differential. We can move to the next slide. German industry not only started to outsource and labor intensive parts and to then import these labor intensive parts to, to be assembled in Germany, they also started who will open up factories around the world. And here you see the locations. The right side, the deep blue. The deep blue tells you these are locations in Europe. 
and especially the Eastern European country of Slovakia has become a major automobile hub. Then you have uh, NAFTA, South America doesn't play much a role, but in Asia, so uh, German car production takes place in China to a huge degree and very little than in Africa. So the German car producers went outside the countries in establishing assembly production that also started to outsource and import then the car parts. We would think that if the German industry is moving so much of the production outside, that it would then reduce the production within Germany, but that did not take place. So that I can show you at the, the next slide. And the next slide shows you the difference between the German car producers who are selling at the high end, which is Audi, BMW, and Mercedes Daimler, they have really increased tremendously their production in Germany. Uh, BMW in 2011 even 2.6 times to what they started out in 1990. The outsource was accompanied by actually more production within Germany than there. But not for all producers. The producers who produce more standard cars were not increasing their production. They kept the production more or less at the same level. Or <coughs> then uh, outside and here especially uh, the, the company called Opel, which is which used to be owned by General Motors. They they were really the losers of it. The next slide shows you that because of production went up. The outsourcing did not reduce employment. This was, of course, the big fear once the companies started to outsource that employment in Germany would be reduced and volume went up. That didn't happen. The reason is that the cost of outsourcing of labor intensive parts, the production became more price competitive. So, by uh, making use of cheap labor next door, the was able to produce more of its products at a lower price and thereby and cutting, becoming more competitive and cutting the Japanese out of the uh, premium se sector. So, uh, Toyota is still extremely uh, important, a car producer. But in the top segment, it had stagnated. It no longer moving uh, to uh, increase its volume. To, uh, the ability of the German companies now also to, to access cheap uh, uh, part components, uh, they became uh, very competitive in this field. In the lower column, in the lower column, you see the wages the hourly wages, which were a bit stagnant in the early 2000s, that was the result of the outsourcing, because the companies were constantly threatening that they would do outsourcing, and so they were hesitant to call for higher wages. The wage moderation, and uh, then in the last years, Wages went up. Currently, the average production cost is not what they the take home. It is what one hour costs the company now forty seven 
57 euro per Kopf. The next slide will also explain what happened. It shows you that have become more important. So lower jobs may have been outpost then higher demand for more skills. Let's be clear for the part by the red line, the red line where the part suppliers were using other few engineers with more in, more in labor intensive business as the labor intensive business had been out for in, uh, the position of the workforce changed in favor of engineers and trying to uh, innovate. Oh, and now finally my last slide. Uh, let's move to the last slide. As I mentioned in the beginning, this very last night. As I mentioned before, one should be always careful not to extrapolate from the past and future. Uh, I had taken that seriously, I would now put to move and I gone to the embassy and not having used the internet visa application. So, uh, it's also true for Germany. One does not quite know whether the effects of the past will actually also lead to success in the future. To focus very much on implement innovation, might lose out with radical innovations, and we have seen a radical innovation in uh, Amazon, for example, a retailer. But we also see now a move towards the electrical engine, and Germany uh, specialized very much in combustion engines uh, uh, with the move towards. The electrical engines, cars, uh, will need to provide some boxes, but an electric needs much fewer power and much fewer hours to be attended. And then the success of exports, it's also rather dependent on the world business cycle. And we see now trade wars. And we see now the virus, and so German industry production is currently decreasing with that the first of the uh, world complications. And the current account surpluses also, also lead to resentments from other countries. And for example, the Trump administration has scolded the Germany very much of running this large account surplus and are threatening the German car industry with tariffs. Okay. So that's in a way the story. We see a long history of success, but we also see great threat in the future. And uh, I bombarded you now with a lot of information, and I hope still a little time that you can raise questions uh, and so thanks thank you Pastor, for, uh, uh, thanks for the uh, educating us on the German uh, trade composition German trade statistics and I believe a very a long de a description on the uh, German uh, trade industry success stories. Uh, I believe the uh, three very important takeaways for us uh, would be the uh, research culture that is basically prevailing in the uh, Germany. 
in how strongly uh, the research culture is basically connected uh, with the research institution and with the industries in, in Germany. Uh, I think the second important takeaway that, that would be the uh, incentive, incentivization or the incentive culture that is prevailing for the researchers in, the, in the Germany. In terms of wages, we can see uh, it has these different images that you know how we can connect the, uh, the, the wages and the incentive structure. And that is also we can see in terms of the innovation, especially in terms of the incremental innovations uh, across the uh, Germany. What was the last point? I didn't get the last point. The, the, the second one was the uh, basically the incentivization of the research culture that is prevailing in Germany in terms of wages and innovations. In the in the third mm -hmm. yes. in the third takeaway, I believe uh, is on the uh, research that is very targeted, that is very uh, focused. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the industry that you guys are looking for. Uh, mm -hmm. So before I open uh, the, the floor for the questions, uh, let me take the privilege and ask you uh, two very important questions uh, to me. The first one is on the, uh, the outsourcing of the German productions, uh, especially to China. Are you guys are, uh, worried about the intellectual property, the IP protections, uh, when you guys are outsourcing your industry's production to the countries where the IPs laws are, you know, uh, you know, uh, they are not like kind of uh, very strengthened or enhanced uh, in, in some developing countries. And again, well, yeah, okay, go ahead. Yeah, the German industry is uh, very keen in supplying the uh, huge Chinese market, but companies are also very apprehensive of the pressure they face by the Chinese government in transferring technology and by the ability of Chinese engineers to work for a while in the German company and then to set up shop across the street and to start their own business having learned of what was to be learned at the German place. So one a very famous example is the high-speed trains that, that uh, were developed, especially the ones that run on magnetic technology that were developed in Germany and uh, now uh, have been tried out in China. And then uh, very quickly afterwards, the Chinese companies have taken over this technology without paying the royalties for it. Uh, that. So there is this attention, and uh, so the German industry, on the one hand, is supporting Trump's pressure on China on intellectual property, and on the other hand, of course, is very afraid uh, that the pressure will lead also then to pressure on their existing companies within China. You know that. So it is, uh, they feel that they're in a bit of a difficult position. But uh, the, uh, so far, they have uh, profited tremendously from China. But as uh, ch the Chinese are able to really catch up very quickly technologically, then in the future, uh, Germany industry has to uh, work even harder to stay on top of uh, advances in technology. Thank you. So let me open the floor for the questions. Um, hi, my name is Nadia. I'm a working by. Um, listening to your presentation and comparing it with the experience of uh, Korean and Taiwan, uh, uh, from the work of uh, Professor Amstrand, what I realize is that uh, the experience of Germany is a bit different. Uh, like what you are saying is that uh, you are keeping, uh, you are training your uh, educated food, uh, you are giving them skills what they need to produce uh, good quality uh, products uh, through innovation and stuff, and then you are giving them a lot of high wages so that uh, they can be efficiency wages and you can enhance the productivity so forth. But comparing with the Korean and Taiwan experience, what Professor Amstein uh, sort of showed was that 
the the comparative advantage they had was of low wages, and to have a low um, a skilled workforce yet keep the wages low so that the cost of production would be low. So that is something I wanted to point. That Germany experience was different than the Korean one. And secondly, in your presentation, you said that after outsourcing, uh, there was no effect on the employment uh, within Germany and also the wages. Uh, if you can explain it a bit, that how how did the because uh, was it because the size of the industry increased post outsourcing? Uh, so if you can explain that that a bit. Thank you. I start with the second part of your question. And uh, you may have to repeat very quickly the first later on because it was not loud enough for me because of the internet. But concerning outsourcing, the story is uh, complicated. We have uh, different types of industries. So Germany no longer has a garment industry. It used to have a large garment industry, but that is basically gone. Uh, few niches open, so the garments are imported from faraway places or from the European periphery like Romania. Uh, so Bangladesh, Romania, those are places where Germany. And but Germany has still a very large textile industry, but the textile industry is completely automated. So they, they doesn't employ anymore. And the issue is what happened to those who used to work in the garment industry. And as in many other countries, uh, in the garment industry, women were employed to a large extent. And I remember from my youth when we traveled outside of Frankfurt into the countryside, there were some places with small garment factories where women were working. And these women then lost these kind of jobs and were absorbed then mostly by the service industry. Uh, they also had a rather low wage industry in Germany. So in, in that respect, the outsourcing had a more negative effect. But that took place already quite a long time ago. The outsourcing in the auto industry, that uh, was beneficial for a higher level of production because it really lowered the input cost and made the production in Germany more uh, cost efficient. Today. However, in the longer term, one sees that the companies are moving ever more of their production outside of Germany, that they are putting their new companies outside of Germany. And so in the longer run, it can well happen that employment will go down in Germany, also in the automobile industry. And it cannot be ruled out that at one point, the Chinese companies will start to export also more premium type of uh, automobiles that probably not too far into the future and then will also be in competition uh, with German industry. So uh, what it means is that in some areas the outsourcing was supportive and uh, was leading also to uh, MOOC structure of the industry making more use of engineers and uh, highly qualified people but the ones with lower skills, they were losing out. So that you have a bifurcation in the employment situation in Germany for that reason. So please meet your first question because of the internet I was not able to. to and please very loud. Okay, uh, I will be very short and I'll try, I'll try to be clear. Uh, what I noticed was uh, that, you know, the experience that you're telling about Germany is different than what we uh, experienced in the uh, case of Korean and Taiwan, uh, uh, the East Asian success, because uh, what their model was, was to 
have educated skilled worker but a low class low wage worker so that they have comparative advantage in cost and at that time obviously global value chains were not developed so what i reckon is the difference between german and the korean experience uh, is that one you are using global value chains uh, uh, also and secondly uh, german industry i think is moving to uh, uh, is in a phase of industrialization which is producing more high tech uh, products uh, as compared to uh, the korean so i just wanted you to uh, clarify is my understanding right here or that's what i was uh, well yes the uh, the high wages uh, in uh, industry force germany to innovations you know otherwise it will not survive uh, there and uh, so the government is supporting a lot of initiatives in high tech uh, there. and um, in the city where i live not where i teach but where i live there is in berlin the capital city now of germany there is a very vibrant uh, startup scene so very, very, because there are three major universities and uh, a lot of young people are coming and the uh, in this, uh, yeah, the government, but also uh, financial players have come. But what is quite interesting is, because of the path dependency, uh, German financing was always more long-term oriented and uh, uh, closer to those who have already been established, that the startup scene in Berlin is pretty much financed by Americans. A uh, very interesting experience. And we'll have to see how that plays out. Because what it could mean is that the big benefits of the startups will accrue to the American financial industry and not so much to uh, then uh, the German uh, financial system. The other part of it is, I think, the success of moving into high tech is not just the engineering at the highest level, but also that workers are well trained. And uh, that also uh, quite a number of workers who have been trained at the vocational level later on go to night schools and then uh, acquire the right to enter the universities and then become engineers. And these engineers are quite important because they do understand the work process quite well. Uh, I have noticed this difference uh, many years ago when I did some research in the United States, that there the difference between what the workers knew and the engineer knew were tremendous. So workers did not know nothing much about the training of engineers and vice versa. And there was very little communication, while in Germany they are much closer to each other and therefore can work much better together. And so what the workers who are actually uh, um, handling the complex machine learn about the problems of the machine, they can and voice their concerns, they can transfer their knowledge to the engineer, they can communicate with the engineers about it, and therefore the result is uh, much better. Sir, my question is, are of, my comments is related to, despite of that, your automobile industry is very competitive. Then the peoples of Pakistan, most even Asian countries people are mostly prefer to use the Japanese car. People. I didn't get the last two words. Despite of that, the, the, sorry, despite of that, the, your automobile industry is very competitive in the world. But the Asian people, particularly Pakistani people, are prefer to use the Japanese car instead of German car. Yes. Uh, that is sort of true for the whole sub-Indian continent that the German producers are not well presented that. And uh, the, 
they were not yeah they were focusing much more on on china and probably it has something to do with over exposure of management you know that uh, you cannot be present all over the place but uh, volkswagen tried to enter the indian market uh, there and uh, by having an alliance with mitsubishi and that broke apart because i think of german hoopers uh, the uh, german managers uh, were apparently not culturally adaptive and uh, were not able to really work together with the japanese and that then uh, killed their entry into the uh, emerging indian car market now they try it again with their own mar uh, um, brand the uh, koda brand and we'll see how that works but they are now coming from behind while in china they were the early movers and uh, are dominating the marketplace in the sub indian continent uh, they, are, uh, they they have neglected that uh, partly probably because they we may also have been skeptical about the growth potential especially then for more complex cars yeah. but it's probably this combination of uh, over extension of really focusing very much then on uh, uh, china and not having the management uh, personnel for uh, the sub indian continent I'm working as general manager in engineering development board at the Nagash Department of Ministry of Industries and Production. Uh, my question to you is again with reference to outsourcing that Germany has done in China uh, in the automotive industry and in many other industries as well. As we come to know that uh, every day the cost of doing business in China is increasing and uh, there are lots of Chinese coming to my office as well. They are closing down their businesses because uh, China is becoming incompetitive in many sectors. And they are looking for other destinations to relocate their industries. Now, in this scenario, how do you look and how do you see the German industries operating in China? Do you think uh, Germany will stay uh, competitive in China? Or uh, do you think that Germany is also Germany will have to look for certain other destinations for relocations or things like that. Uh, <coughs> second part of my question will be that, uh, which again pertains to the same uh, context. We recently had the Pakistan-China free trade agreement, and China gave us China rather opened uh, 313 tariff lines to Pakistan for uh, Pakistani industries to export to China. Now, automotive sector is one of those sectors which has been opened up for exports to China at zero rating. Zero rating on those auto parts and components which were previously being exported to China at 5 to 35% export duty rates. Now, with this kind of a scenario coming up, do you see that uh, China is not com uh, becoming uncompetitive in uh, specifically with this auto parts and component manufacturing industry? That's why they have opened up in uh, this uh, the second phase of uh, Pakistan-China FTA. Mm -hmm. Well, um, concerning the uh, German industry moving out of China. Uh, I don't see that so much because <clears throat> the key is really the automobile, the chemical industry. It is uh, not a garment industry because uh, German companies are not owning garment locations, but they might source them in the future garments more from other places. So they are not relocating. 
uh, factories, but they are sourcing them from other places because they are not owning those factories. Owning the factories in China and the automobile industry, and I don't believe they will uh, move that to other places so easily because the automobile production is very much uh, dependent on what is called cluster. So they need to have then the suppliers around. However, certain suppliers, especially in the labor intensive areas like wiring, might move out of China. But these companies, wiring companies and so on, these are not owned by German companies. So these would be Chinese suppliers that would then relocate some of their production to other places. Currently, a major location is uh, Vietnam, but uh, certainly that could also be the case then for, for Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan probably has currently the disadvantage that it is further away from the major industrial hubs in China. So uh, Vietnam is a little closer and can also make use then of uh, sea transportation and so on. But uh, China is also investing a lot in streets. And uh, so I suppose that in the future, uh, Pakistan will be better connected to the key production locations in China. The question for Pakistan is probably whether in which direction the traffic will go uh, there. And uh, will Pakistan be well, on the recipient end of the uh, industrial might of China, or will it be able to also into the supply chains of Chinese companies? I think that will be probably the key uh, future challenge uh, there. And that is related then probably also to the uh, free trade agreement. To what extent then the free trade agreement uh, opening up possibilities for Pakistan in supplying then uh, Chinese supply chains. The issue with free trade agreements is usually that they are uh, supporting more of the status quo at the moment and are usually hindering uh, the possibilities for upgrade. That's uh, at least, look, I have not looked at the uh, Pakistan China, China agreement. For example, looking at the agreement of Vietnam to uh, the US, it is quite clear that Vietnam had to open up its services, its high school services, I would say. Those are the places where you spend a lot of money uh, in return, but uh, at first, to U.S. markets in uh, low field areas. So I think that we go created free trade agreements. Uh, one has to watch out, extend the free trade agreement will allow future upgrading or whether it will block the upgrading. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you so much, uh, Chris. Uh, I think we are done here. Uh, before uh, I end uh, the session, Nadeem Haksab, Vice Chancellor Pyle, he was passing regards to you. Uh, he was here uh, during the presentation, uh, but unfortunately he had to go before the closing for another commitment. So again, thanks, and uh, this was a really productive uh, session for us, and I believe uh, the faculty uh, and then the students learned a lot from this uh, gathering. So thank you so much. Well, thanks for the presentation and the willingness to listen to uh, a bit impaired session of uh, an internet that is not yet to the highest standard uh, in my hotel here in, in Dubai. But thanks again for your interest and your interesting questions and hopefully next time I'll be with you in person and not just in cyberspace. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Looking forward.